This is Moments of Truth, the webcast with and for customer success professionals. I'm your host, Andrew Marks, co-founder of Success Hacker. Today, I'm joined by Ed Powers, a longtime customer success and operations leader based out of Fort Collins, Colorado. Ed is a 30-year business professional with eight years of experience in customer success as both practitioner and consultant. Ed was the former VP of client success for IntelliSecure, a managed services security provider. He established and improved customer success, customer support and professional services as a contract VP of operations for LifePix and set up US operations for SimPro software as VP of customer success. He's an electrical engineer and statistician, an American Society of Quality Certified Six Sigma Black Belt and a former examiner for the Malcolm, Malcolm Baldridge National Quality Award. Ed specializes in, in combining the latest advances in neuroscience with enterprise data analytics and continuous improvement. Ed, welcome to the program and thanks for making time for me today. Great to be with you as always, Andrew. So Ed, in customer success, we regularly talk about things like churn percentage, gross, dollars churn, net recurring revenue, et cetera. Something we hear all the time is that CS should be more data driven. I'm a big proponent of using data and KPIs to manage and make decisions that will benefit both the customers we serve and our internal teams. Can you give me an example of why folks in customer success should pay attention to the numbers? That's a great question. And uh, let me tell you a story. So a VP of customer success gets called into his CEO's office and that CEO is just not happy. Churn rates have gone up in the last period from 8% to 12%. The board's not happy, the CEO's not happy. They say, you know, I got some bad news here. Despite everything you're doing, things are going the wrong direction. We need to make a change. So uh, we have no further need for your services. Turns out this is a very bad decision because in this case, that 4% difference has absolutely nothing to do with that VP or with, with his team. Absolutely nothing to do with it. It was just a random outcome. Well, what, 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 do you, what, do you mean, what do you mean by that, a random outcome? <laughs> well, let me dig into that a little bit. Something that I, I hear and read all the time in books, customer success books and on, on blogs, is uh, where people say, well, look, if uh, let's talk about how we measure churn, right? Let's say I have 100 customers and 10 of them cancel their agreements. So my churn rate is 10%, right? Right. Turns out that's not true. The hmm. churn rate is 10% plus or minus 6%. What that means is that the real churn rate is anywhere from 4% to 16%, right? So uh, that's a very big swing. That's a very big swing, and that's all just due to randomness. Wait, 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 wait a minute. What? What? Wait, I, why? That doesn't make that doesn't make sense. What? Why? Why is that? Well, it has to do with something called the law of large numbers, which which is a mathematical law. And what it says is that any time we take a sample from a population, we will always have something called sampling error. This is a mathematical truth, okay? And the only time we have absolute certainty in any measurement that we take is when we're dealing with the entire population. So if you think about this, um, the only time that 10% number is true is when we're looking in the rear view mirror, when we say our population is what happened in the past. So it's perfectly fine to say we measured a 10% churn rate in the past, that is a true statement. That's what our churn rate was, but that's not what our churn rate is. And the reason is, is that we are always taking samples almost all the time in business. We're taking snapshots in time and we're trying to understand and characterize the behavior of the business and the processes and what customers are doing. So anytime we're taking samples, these little snapshots of time, there will always be uncertainty. And what that means is most of the numbers that we see on a day-to-day -day basis are just random noise. They are not meaningful signals. Most of the numbers, most? So what, so what, what, 
so what do you mean by that? That that seems so. It's almost like, why are we doing it then? Yeah, well, it, it because people don't really stop to think about this. So, in terms of the numbers, if we recall, maybe from our high school or grade school, we talked about sets and populations and samples and things like that. What the law of large numbers says is that if we're trying to detect a big difference between two populations or between two samples, big differences, like 50% difference, we don't need a whole lot of data samples to determine that difference. In fact, um, for a 50% difference, we might need only about four data points to, to show that mathematically. But if we wanna get measure a difference of 5%, well, now we need 400 samples. If we want to get half of 1%, another order of magnitude, we want to detect a very small difference. Now we need 40,000 samples, right? So most people don't stop to think about the fact that we need more data to resolve smaller and smaller differences. But um, a few percentage points here and there doesn't sound like a big deal. I mean, what, yeah, what, is that, what does that times, translate to in real money? Yeah, and, and most times that doesn't matter, right? But we're in customer success, and you probably know, I know, Andrea, it's part of your training and your classes, is that a small difference in revenue retention multiplied over time as we stack that up makes a huge difference, right? Even a small percentage, the way that the subscription model works, accumulates into lots of revenue. In fact, Bessemer Ventures said uh, some years ago, that a 2% difference in churn rate impacts company valuation by 20%. And, and 20%, I mean, that's that's millions of dollars. I mean, Millions that's and millions, yeah, it's huge, absolutely huge. So what that means is we need to be really accurate when it comes to tracking, and we need to use statistics to be able to separate these signals from all this random noise. Okay. Okay. So, so where does the concept of being more data driven fit in? To the yeah. Whole so let's talk success? about, let's talk about human nature. Okay. So we humans use our intuition way more often than we do our logic. And that's how we're wired. In fact, we are predisposed over human evolution to automatically jump to conclusions. And we, we do this all the time, right? I mean, we may hear something, for example, about somebody and maybe it's a story and we immediately believe, oh, well, that's true. Obviously this is what's going on until we hear the other side of the story, right? And we get right. more evidence and we say, huh, well, this is a little more complicated than I thought. There's a little more to this. Maybe the truth isn't the first thing I thought it was, right? So our intuition is something that causes us to jump to conclusions, right? And those conclusions aren't always right. In fact, there have been some studies that show when we are in a what's called a, a low uh, reliability kind of environment, our intuition is right only about half the time. I mean, we're actually better served by flipping a coin. But if you're in business, that does not do, right? If you said, uh, if your boss said to you, well, is this gonna work? Well, uh, I don't know, let me flip a coin and find out. That's not acceptable, right? They want, they want some certainty here. What's really gonna work and can you actually predict that? And in order to do that, we need to use data. We have to use logic. We have to drill down into the facts and the truth. And when you're data driven, you're dealing with the facts. So being data driven isn't just about looking at the data, it's about interpreting the data in the right way. That is exactly right. Yeah, it's exactly right. And the, the thing that we don't stop to think about is uh, the numbers can lie to us and they often do. And in the example we, we kicked off, you know, a 4% swing, we immediately assume that there's something to that. We don't assume that, well, that just could be random noise. That could be meaningless, right? So part of what being data driven is, is understanding how the numbers actually work and what they say and what they don't, because it is not always apparent. And statistics helps us sort all of that out. Yeah, and so even if you're not actually crunching these numbers, it's still important for you to understand and interpret the data correctly. That's exactly right, to think critically about the information that you're looking at. 
So you you talked about um, you know we, we we talked about churn rates, but where else does this math, this 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 uh, this data driven decision making math apply in customer success? Anytime we're dealing with calculating customer health scores, which is something we absolutely care about, forecasting revenue, which we're often asked to do, uh, looking at NPS and CSAT scores, giving feedback to the product team about what's happening, uh, get, generating and calculating the ROI of customer success, all of those are things that require data. So, so let's start with health scores. Can you give me, give me some examples? Yeah, and this is pretty common, and I'm sure people listening will probably nod their heads up and down. A lot of times when you first construct your, health, your customer health dashboard, that's pretty subjective. That's pretty intuitive, right? Teams usually start by, you know, red, yellow, green. Red, what does your gut say? Is this, is this account going to churn? Uh, are they are they good? Do you call them green or is it yellow? Maybe they're somewhere in between, right? right. So that's where most most organizations start, and I've seen that, and probably you've seen that, and oh, yeah. probably people listening have seen that too. Uh, surprisingly, a lot of these customer success technology vendors start there too. They will say when they're configuring the customer health scores, they say, "Well, what what data do you think is important?" Well. I think it's this, or they may say, well, you should, you should put these other factors in. And then they say, well, well, how would you weight those? Well, do you I give this one 10%, maybe we give that one 20% or whatever, but it's very, very subjective. It's well, what does your gut say at the end of the day? Right. Well, believe it or not, it's possible to use math, to use regression analysis from the data itself. If I have the factors and I have the outcomes, I can take that set of data and I can generate an equation from that just by using regression analysis. So I will automatically get from the data itself the factors that are meaningful and which ones are not, and the appropriate weighting on those factors, right? right. So it's just a matter of math. Yeah. And then if you take it to the next level and you start using things like predictive analytics, then you can get really, really accurate on how you do that. So, okay, so what, what do you mean by yeah, I mean, what, what do you mean by accurate? Sure. Well, you know, if you if you spend all of your time with a, a strategic account and you're talking to them on a daily basis and you know all the decision makers and your buddies with everybody, you probably have a really accurate, you know, pretty good feeling about what that account's going to do just from your experience. That's great in a high touch environment. But you know, we're always trying to drive for scale and work the long tail and, you know, tech touch and all of that. You can't do that, right? So what I've seen with, um, with some of these predictive analytics approaches is they can have, they can be 98% accurate predicting outcomes at scale just by using the math alone. So you can get some pretty amazing accuracy at that point. Yeah, that is, that is pretty, pretty amazingly accurate. So CS leaders are expected to, to do more than just provide reports and deliver revenue forecasts. They're expected to improve results. So mm -hmm. how does being data-driven help in that endeavor? Right. And now we're talking about something that's near and dear to my heart, which is the laws of cause and effect. This is physics, right? Yeah. So how does X affect Y? Does, does X predict Y? We're starting to get into that discussion. And we may think about science class years ago back in school, right? When our science teachers talked about the scientific method and they said, okay, we're gonna do these experiments, right? And uh, what you start with is an observation. You know, we, we think we see something going on here. Then we generate a hypothesis, which is an educated guess as to what's happening, right? This is causing that. Then we construct an experiment and we collect some data and we either validate or refute what, what our hypotheses are and we present the results. That's the scientific method, right? And, and scientists have been doing this you know, for, for centuries. Well, business works pretty much in the same way if you think about it, right? There's cause and effect relationships. So we have outcomes. We wanna retain customers. We wanna grow our revenue. And then upstream, there's factors that tend to lead to that, right? So it's the same kind of a process where we think about 
we're observing what we think is happening, but let's take some data and let's validate that. So when we, when we analyze that data, then we can really understand and quantify those critical relationships and then be able to predict it. So for example, um, you know, time to value. People talk about time to value. It's really important. You want to shorten your time to value. Great. Well, to what effect or to what extent does a shorter time to value actually impact customer churn rates? Right. Well, that is a testable hypothesis. We can gather data and we can, we can examine that. Does a new training video in our onboarding process, does that cause people to use a feature more often? That's a testable hypothesis. Let's go <laughs> run an experiment, collect some data, let's analyze that. So all of this is statistics. And again, we're not dealing on what, what someone else did. We're not just copying what they do or you know, accepting conventional wisdom. That may not apply to you, right? That's all subjective. It's easy, it's quick, right? We'll just copy what someone else does, but it may not be right and it may not be the truth. So we need to find our own truths and we need to do that using data. Those, those tools, those statistical tools are there to help you analyze that data. And then being able to prove uh, those relationships using data helps you to make improvements that lead to better results. Yeah? That is exactly it. That's exactly it. And there are some frameworks, some tools like Plan, Do, Check, Act and Lean Six Sigma um, that incorporate all of this. That's core to what it is because it's scientific method, right? Right. And then when you apply these things, what you're really getting at, if you're looking at how do I improve my business results, if I can examine those root causes and I know exactly what they are and I have facts and evidence that support my hypothesis, when I solve that problem, then my solution is, has a much more dramatic and uh, larger impact on the outcome. And it's much more sustainable. So when we're dealing with facts and not just supposition and try, you know, trial, trial and error, we're getting better results and we're getting them faster. So the 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 uh, the biggest um, opportunity is to use math and statistics to do that. There's always going to be those. I like to refer to them as the watermelon accounts, right? The green on the outside, red on the inside, and you're you're <laughs> never going to be able to eliminate all of that. Right? right. You're never going to eliminate all that. But but by using, you know, a data driven approach, you're going to, you know, minimize the amount of those outliers. Right. Right. And you get consistently better. High performing organizations do continuous improvement. It's not about where you are. Yep. It's that you're getting continuously better and better and better. That's what a high performing organization looks like. So you mentioned proving the ROI of customer success, which is always a hot topic. And quite frankly, if you're a customer success leader and you're not thinking about that, you should be. So what does that have to do with being data-driven? Well, the great example here is COVID, right? We went through um, uh, the earlier part of the year all of these clinical, clinical trials that were going on as the scientific community was developing these vaccines and they would do these, these double blind studies, right? So you had a test group and a control group and the people in the study didn't know what was being injected into their arm. They, they were part of the study, but then the scientists knew which one was which and they would compare the differences, right? So that's pretty standard practice, these clinical trials. And if you think about customer success, that's exactly how you would prove it. That's exactly how you would prove the, the financial impact and the ROI of customer success. You would have two different groups, right? A test group and a control group. And they look exactly the same, but with one, you're going to apply the customer success treatment and the other one you leave alone, right? And you contrast those two and you measure the difference. And whatever that difference is in the outcome, more customers retained, more uh, install based revenue, whatever that is, that proves exactly what that, in, what that to impact is going to be. Now, that's kind of a difficult thing to do. That's, if that, that's a pretty, <laughs> if you're a customer <laughs> success leader, right, right, that's pretty ballsy. That's, that's a ballsy very ballsy. You know, is there, is there, a, is, there, is, there a, is there a better, is there, is there another way to do that? Well, another way is to, to do the before and after, right? I right. mean, if you have a situation where you have an organization who's never done it before yeah. and you've been tracking that, you have some baseline and then you start doing it right. and you make the assumption of our customers today 
are similar to the customers we had yesterday and those conditions are about the same. So we can make that same argument of there's a difference between the two. And this is from my own experience, um, having stood up a brand new customer success organization and tracking it, I've seen results of about a 30% improvement. Uh, and that's fairly consistent when I've talked to other people, kind of the before and after. So 30% improvement reduction in churn, if you will, by being proactive and running a good you know, a process for that, that's, that's pretty reasonable, right? So that's another way of doing it. But the point is, if you don't measure these things, if you're not using data, then how would you ever know? How can you come back after the fact and say, well, we made a difference? The question is, well, prove it. Where's your data, right? You, you don't have that data. So uh, I think the biggest opportunity at the end of the day is, uh, is looking at the churn problem across the enterprise, right? Customer success certainly makes an impact on certain motions, right? From the time of, of closing the deal to you know, the promises that, that we make in sales and marketing for the value, actually demonstrating that and actually getting that customer to value, customer success is all over that. But you know, across the whole enterprise, this also applies. Well, yeah, churn, churn is an enterprise-wide problem, right? Mm -hmm. And I, th I think we lose sight of that. They get overly focused on, on, on the customer success operation and think, well, they're the everything department. They're there to, to make sure that customers renew. How can we use data to understand what's happening and what other departments can do to help? Or even, you know, maybe not just help, but what other departments may be having a negative impact on churn? Exactly. And one of my favorite statistical tools is something called a Pareto diagram. And you've probably heard of the 80-20 rule or yeah. something like that. Yeah. So it's the idea of uh, the critical few and the trivial many. Right, the maldistribution. There's a there's a subset that really causes most of it. In other words, so um, what the what the uh, Pareto analysis allows you to do is to figure out what do you need to focus on, and what is really impactful, and what isn't. Right. So how do I sharpen my focus and go after the things that really matter? So one way to to do this is to ask customers, why did you quit? Why did you churn? Right. And you can do that qualitatively and you can do that quantitatively. But if you can get some data and you ask them, give me the top reasons why you're why you're switching and not not ask the salesperson, not ask the CSM, but go to the customer and ask them, why are you switching? And they will take off well because of your product, you know, isn't reliable or it costs too much or we never got the value out of it. They will give you some reasons. Right. And it could be product reasons, it could be service reasons, it could be price reasons, it could be any one, uh, you know, we're going out of business, we're financially strapped, you know, all those other kind of reasons. But we can capture that and quantify that and then reflect that in a Pareto diagram. And it's very easy mm -hmm. to then relate this X percent means Y amount of dollars. Right. And it's, it's literally back of the envelope type of calculations where you could say, okay, product team, you own this much, customer support, you own this much, customer success, we own this much, right. sales and marketing, you own that much, right? So now you can really focus in on who really owns this, everybody contributes to this, right? But once you have that data, now you can make that economic argument. Let's uh, spend a few minutes before we wrap up talking about your data-driven decision-making course that you launched alongside the Success Hacker team here last year. We've, we've had a couple of cohorts go through. Uh, I think it'd be great for you to talk a bit about the course, what you cover, who it's aimed for, the format, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, great. And it's been a wonderful association working with you and your team, Andrew, and, I, and we've, uh, we've uh, had some really good results from it so far and really excited about it. So this is aimed at customer success leaders or people who are aspiring to be customer success leaders. I think everybody needs to have some base level understanding of this, uh, but it's also aimed at folks that are um, in CS operations, you know, the people that the leaders are depending on to, to generate reports and to analyze this data and to really generate insights, what's really going on here. So for those people who are dealing with this every day, it's a great course. It's a Statistics 101 course. Uh, we tend not to get a whole lot of that in high school and college, but going through those fundamentals 
And what we do in this course, which is different, is that we have tons of real world applications and customer success. All the things we talked about, health scores and NPS and you know, product feedback and all those kinds of things. So we actually go through those examples and these are tangible real world things that people run into all the time. It's a 10 week long class, instructor led, there's uh, videos to watch, there's homework assignments. And then we get together once a week for about an hour to go through and uh, do some instruction as well. So a couple hours a week, two, three hours a week is the time commitment. It's spread over 10 weeks. So it's not too onerous. It's not too unmanageable. And uh, you get a certification at the end of the day, which is really cool. Right. Uh, what about that customer success leader who has an operations person or who has data scientists who can do the statistics, but want to know how to interpret the data, how to question mm -hmm. the data? Even if you don't get into the nitty gritty statistics, you still should know what those numbers are, what they mean, how they came from. So you can at least uh, look at them, speak to them intelligently and question stuff. Exactly. And, and a lot of what we teach in this course is, is more conceptual. I mean, you, it, you use Microsoft Excel. We're not asking you to derive a whole bunch of equations. I mean, it really is, here's some data, apply the tools, what does this mean? Right. And regardless, if you already have data scientists on your staff grinding this stuff out, boy, it's really good to understand what they're working on and what yeah. that really means. Right. Even though you're not going to drill down into the details and actually do the data manipulation and all of that, right. when they start you know, doing their tech talk, it's great to, to understand what they're telling you and what that means. And then you can provide them direction. You know, that doesn't sound right. I think we need to go this direction, right? right. So the more you know about this, even at a surface level, even just using some basic tools, the yeah. better off you're going to be as a leader. Excellent. Ed, thank you for uh, spending some time with me today, sharing what is an incredibly valuable skill for leaders and customer success, as well as operations folks. Once again, we, we also appreciate you being a great partner and, uh, and have a great rest of your day and week and weekend. And I will talk to you soon. Always a pleasure, Andrew. Thanks for your time. 